Welcome to the Well Jewish Congress web talk series. I'm Dr. Afuat Sofer and I'm a JD with the WJC Jewish Diplomatic Corps. We are very honored and very excited this, uh, this evening in London um, to be joined by the Ambassador of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United States, His Excellency Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa. This is a very, very momentous occasion for the World Jewish Congress. And on behalf of the WJC, Your Excellency, I would really like to thank you for joining us. And I would also like to offer our condolences for the recent passing of your Prime Minister. Um, he was a, a, a figure, a really formidably influential figure, and um, we, we do send our most sincere condolences. Well, thank you, Dr. Sofer. Uh for your heartfelt condolences and uh, thank you to the World Jewish Congress for having me today. It is such an honor and such a pleasure to be joining you uh, in, a, in a very critical time, not only for Bahrain, but for the Middle East. Uh, and I commend all the work that the World Jewish Congress has been doing since its inception in 1936. And uh, this is exactly why the the reason for me being here today is to speak about the Accords and any other uh, topic that you would like to hear. We, we are just, again, very, very excited to have you here. And um, as, as we know, the, our favorite region in the world is an ever-evolving region. And yesterday um, was another momentous occasion where we saw the historic visit of um, His Excellency Dr. Abdul Latif bin Rashid Al Zayani, the for, your foreign minister, to Israel, which was just incredibly moving to see him touch down at Ben Gurion Airport. Um, it's so so encouraging and such a a quick and meaningful um, symbolism of the Abrahamic Accords um, between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain and uh, subsequent, subsequently Sudan. We really, really do salute the courage and the vision of your government to take this bold step. How do you see the opportunities for both Israel and Bahrain to benefit from this bilateral cooperation? Uh, thank you, Dr. Sofer. Uh, obviously the uh, trip yesterday uh, comes at a very exciting time. Uh, it is the first official Bahraini delegation ever to set foot anywhere in Israel. It's the first time our national carrier, Gulf Air, has landed in Israel, and it surely is not going to be the last. Um, and for those on the flight number GF972... I loved, I loved the numbering of that, Ambassador. Uh, I think that their boarding passes will be hung on their walls and their offices or their homes uh, somewhere. But uh, all in all, the trip, uh, we saw a lot of warmth uh, when the foreign minister uh, arrived. Uh, he was welcomed by Israeli prime minister. Uh, he was at a residence. Uh, he got to meet the president. And uh, there were some announcements as well. Um, I think that those announcements, which included e-visas, uh, the opening of embassies, and, the, and, and up to 14 flights and five cargo flights a week, wow. speak volumes in terms of uh, uh, a, a warm peace. Uh, and that, that was a question that I was asked in the past couple of weeks here in Washington. And we're seeing uh, momentum like no other in terms of the Accords, uh, due to the work that's being done, not only between our two countries, but also uh, the excellent work that's being done by the United States and our friends here in Washington. It, it is. The, the, the United States has been a remarkable facilitator in carrying out this vision. How does it feel um, sitting where you are? You must have been incredibly busy with these talks. Well, uh, First of all, I think that uh, we need to give uh, credit to uh, everyone that was involved in bringing us to where we are today. And 
from our perspective, uh, His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa has for since 2002, uh, when the constitution was drafted, the uh, prospect of uh, religious tolerance was enshrined within our constitution. And the work that, has, that we've seen over the past two decades or so has brought us to a point where the decision was made and it was truly a bold and historic uh, decision, which was, uh, uh, I mean, we've seen from Bahrain a lot of acceptance from different fractions within society. And so uh, it's not an overnight decision. Uh, it was one that was made uh, over a, a long period of time. And I think there are many examples in which we can uh, remind some of our viewers of, and I think this is a, a momentous occasion to do so. Um, I was posted here back in 2017. And in the past three years or so, the work that we have seen uh, in terms of this specific area was phenomenal. Uh, back in 2017, there was the publishing of the Bahrain Declaration. Uh, it is a document that echoed the sentiments of His Majesty and uh, designed to promote religious freedom and peaceful coexistence on a global stage. It urged people of all faiths to reject the sentiments of terrorism, intolerance, and hate. Uh, in the inauguration, His Highness Sheikh Nasser was here in California uh, and uh, the work that was done by the King Hamad Global Center for Peaceful Coexistence uh, made it possible. Also in 2017, we saw an NGO called This is Bahrain visit Jerusalem, uh, which included uh, key religious figures uh, from our community. In 2018, there were two very interesting statements that were put forth by the former foreign minister the first one was in a panel discussion organized by the Atlantic Council where he said that Israel is part of the heritage of the region. Also in that year, he tweeted that any state in the region, including Israel, is entitled to defend itself by destroying the sources of danger. That was following an Israeli attack on Iranian material uh, and Syria most likely would have been used in an attack against it. Yeah. And in, in 2019, two very, very important steps. The Peace to Prosperity Workshop was hosted in Bahrain, was, which was the economic component yes. of the U.S.'s peace initiative. Um, our former foreign minister met with the Israeli press there in the heart of the capital, uh, Manama. Uh, and um, in 2019, the Middle East Security Conference in Warsaw also hosted our foreign minister, uh, with his counterparts from the region. And then on the same stage, uh, we saw the Israeli prime minister minutes apart. And so I think there, there were a lot of uh, big and small steps that were taken that helped shape um, the position to bring us to where we are today. And each, it, it was fascinating to watch as an observer of, of the Gulf and the Middle East. It was absolutely incredible to watch because I'd always known that the concept of tolerance within Bahrain is something really embedded within the Bahraini society. Um, to all our viewers, this, this it really is one of the kind of uh, touchstones of Bahraini society. And what was truly amazing was to see it reflected in uh, publicly in, in your foreign policy, which was absolutely uh, miraculous to watch and, and very bold. And I think it, uh, if, if I dare say, would really does put Bahrain uh, where, where it needs to be within the um, sphere of action within, within the Gulf and within the Middle East, because I find that Bahrain really does have a lot to offer to the narrative. Uh, absolutely, Dr. Silver. I think that uh, going back to the Accords, uh, what we are working on right now is making sure that the Accords are successful uh, because uh, others will be looking at, uh, at this success, measuring the success 
And uh, the more successful it is, the more momentum we will see from the region. Uh, I think that these, uh, these accords do two things, basically. Uh, first of all, it unlocks opportunities. Yeah. Uh, countries uh, have different challenges. Uh, obviously, last year, the pandemic has put a lot of pressure on governments around the world. But it also, uh, coupled with the uh, oil prices, uh, governments in the Middle East uh, have been put in uh, somewhat of a, of, a, of a difficult position. And uh, the cornerstone of uh, prosperity in any country would be economic stability. Uh, although His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, has launched the Vision uh, 2030 back in 2008, uh, that vision has, has worked for us, uh, but with the upcoming challenges, we have always uh, kind of catered to the challenges and moved forward. Uh, but here we are thinking outside the box, unlocking uh, indefinite potential when it comes to a new agreement uh, and an untapped uh, opportunity that we hope will bring a lot of prosperity for both our peoples in the very near future. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first delegation that was uh, uh, that visited Bahrain from Israel uh, was a trade delegation. Uh, we also saw the Secretary of the Treasury from the United States fly out, and I think it sent a very positive message. Um, both countries are moving in somewhat the same direction when it comes to some of the industries, and I know that there will be a lot of work that uh, could be done through our entrepreneurs and the private sector. I, I couldn't agree more because I find I'm looking at the Israeli and the Bahraini economies. We are economies that look for innovation and kind of financial services and, and the whole economic model, I think, lends itself to working so beautifully together. So, yeah, it's, it's all very, very, very promising. Um, one of the other things that I noticed from um, just after the Abrahamic Accords were signed was that the Bahraini government adopted the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, um, which um, it's something that we at the World Jewish Congress take very seriously in our work towards battling anti-Semitism around the world. And that was something that we really did salute. And, um, and we thank you for that because it is such an effective tool in working together to battle anti-Semitism. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sofer. Uh, I have to uh, tip my hat to my uh, colleagues at the uh, King Hamid Global Center for Peaceful Coexistence for coming together with the State Department in uh, signing this MOU. This is important because it's the first MOU uh, to be signed with an Arab state. And uh, it has within it the uh, components of... Uh, of uh, religious tolerance and peaceful coexistence. Um, and at the same time, what we're doing is we're also looking at uh, education because education is important. Um, we're looking at an entity here in the United States to uh, revisit some of the programs that have already been deployed in, uh, in our uh, curriculum, uh, specifically speaking about uh, the introduction of an anti-extremism uh, seminar within a, a, a bigger program that has been deployed, uh, which is called the anti-violence and, and anti-addiction program. Yes. Yes. It, it's been conducted by community police officers. And I think that adding another element of that, um, it, it's going to be the first uh, time we work with this entity and deploy it in Bahrain. If it proves successful, it's going to be uh, uh, deployed in other countries as well. That is truly groundbreaking. It's something that's so related that could really um, be also rolled out in a, in a internationally. It's the 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 effects could be huge. So um, no, th really, really thank you for that. Um, if we could segue to um, the Jewish community in Bahrain, 
um, which I know rather well. Um, the um, history of the Jewish community in Bahrain dates back to Talmudic times, um, as I understand, and um, have their own representation in government. And um, um, they, um, they are providers of two of my personal role models of their excellencies, Huda Nunu and Nancy Kadori. Um, and it's, it's, it's something very, very interesting that the, the relationship with the Bahraini government has been um, very, very close with the Jewish community, even before normalization. Um, would you care to speak a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the, like you clearly stated, the, the Jewish community in Bahrain dates back to the uh, 19th century, even maybe before. Um, it has always played an important and prominent role in Bahrain's history and has been an integral part of our, our national fabric. Um, back in 2008, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Huda Nunu was the first Jewish Arab woman to be appointed as an ambassador to the United States. After she served in our appointed uh, Shura Council, which is the appointed house in our legislature. Um, in addition to the elected house, the appointed house uh, serves as, as, a, as a guarantee for representation. And prior to her, uh, it was uh, uh, Mr. Ibrahim uh, Dawood Nunu, yes. who was a member of the council. And since 2008, uh, we have my friend, Her Excellency, Ms. Nancy Khadouri, uh, as a member of the council, um, uh, who I, I have to say that in 2007 yes. has written a famous book um, entitled From Our Beginnings to Present Day. Yes, I have her book on my bookshelf. It is a brilliant, brilliant book. I had the pleasure of meeting her here in London, and she's just absolutely delightful. And, and, and the book is fascinating. Book, yes, in her book, she, she describes and she documents the history of Bahraini Jews since the late 1800s. Um, but uh, we've seen the indigenous society play an important role in, uh, in Bahrain. Um, it, it is interesting now to see uh, developments in, uh, for example, the synagogue, where in the past, uh, it used to cater to uh, uh, the numbers in Bahrain. Uh, but now, with the introduction of flights, uh, all of a sudden we will need to upgrade it. And the, the Nunu family uh, are undergoing that renovation. And hopefully, within uh, January, or February, it should be uh, it should be ready. Um, it's also interesting to see how kosher meals are starting to be offered at uh, five star. I saw that. Up. That is very exciting. Uh, but uh, I mean, all. This is an exciting time for uh, not just Bahrain, but the region as a whole. And uh, we have embraced the change. We have embraced the shift in, in mindset and paradigm. And uh, we're looking forward to a, to a brighter future for our younger generations. But also, we're thinking of um, the other countries in the region. And we are looking at uh, for the past 10 years or so, there are some of the uh, youth that have uh, uh, basically, they, they weren't going to school. Uh, there's lack of education. Um, there's there's uh, a lot of challenges within some of those countries. And we hope that uh, this sort of an agreement will give the other nations a push uh, towards hope that their issues can also be resolved. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree, because when you look at the region, it's um, I think it, it takes states as, as, as brave and forward thinking as Bahrain, as the United Arab Emirates to really show everyone a different perspective and to transform the paradigm because and, and these I know these are cliches, but they're really, really true because they really are happening in the region in real time. And the paradigm shift is phenomenal. And the way I can see it, it'll probably it'll be felt internally within uh, the Gulf and Middle Eastern society, and I think will um, the dividends will be shown externally as well. 
Uh, one thing that I have said, uh, Dr. Sofer, is that uh, when you look at the list of priorities for uh, those that are uh, in the Middle East today, they are very different than what they were in the past. And when you look specifically at the Arab-Israeli uh, relationship, uh, most of those, if we were to go back to the first Intifada, for example, yeah. Uh, for a seven-year-old kid uh, that is now no longer uh, in the uh, quote-unquote youth category, unfortunately, uh, I, I don't remember uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, I mean, you look at those that are younger than me growing up, um, they have a, a different set of priorities. They're looking at a certain quality of life that they would like to uh, uh, that they aspire to uh, to live in, and it it really changes uh, the dynamics. Yes, it's 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 truly amazing, and it's interesting that you raise that because this what I find with it's our generation is the kind of identity wise where we are we are both where we're all sitting at the moment. We are, we are both kind of the Jewish communities, uh, the, the Muslim communities and Bahrain and Israel are both uh, have a very illustrious history and a, a deep traditions, but are also very, very um, look very firmly into the future. And I find that this is um, perhaps you could share with us whether you think this is something that we could possibly work on together as well. While it's this element of looking forward while still maintaining our identity. Yeah, this is a, this is definitely an important element within any society um, is to look at uh, common values, to look at uh, shared interests, and uh, to look at identity. And where those converge is where the opportunities might lay. Uh, and. I just want to go back to a, um, a very important point when it comes to the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Uh, I think this was said many times over where, uh, and, and maybe the foreign minister said it uh, in his visit, yes. uh, but it was also said on the South Lawn in, in DC, is that, um, we haven't abandoned the Palestinian cause. Uh, we still believe in a two-state solution. We hope that the work that's being done between Bahrain and Israel is gonna incentivize the Palestinians to uh, come to an agreement with the Israelis. And we stand ready to do what we can uh, in order to uh, bring closer uh, the two parties, uh, if need be. So uh, it, uh, again, it's 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 going to be very interesting to see how things develop in uh, the uh, future. It'll be very interesting to have a facilitator such as Bahrain in this setting. I find because I I, I think I truly believe that you'd be able to offer a different perspective and communicate with the Palestinian leadership in a in a unique and innovative way that would, I, I, I believe, would bring us closer to coming to an agreement and to a, to a sustainable agreement, a realistic agreement. And um, yeah, inshallah, you're successful in that and we're, we'll all be able to work on it together. Um, and it's, it's, how did it feel? Were you, how did it feel for you being on the South Lawn watching? Were you at the ceremony? I imagine you were. Absolutely. I think it was uh, uh, very surreal. Uh, it took a couple of days uh, for not just myself, uh, others on the team to uh, really understand what was going on and how, moment, how historic this moment was. Um, and uh, just going back and looking at what brought us here, yeah. but also uh, looking at what can be done going forward. And I think that Bahrain has developed very quickly working groups to make sure that there is a continuation to the momentum. Those working groups have already met. 
uh, and we're starting to see uh, some of the outcomes of those meetings uh, in uh, being announced in uh, uh, yesterday, today, and uh, yes. in the near future as well. The announcements come on a daily basis. It's absolutely incredible to see. Um, and you, you have to follow it very closely not to miss uh, an announcement. <laughs> and um, the, the main ones, how do you see the main announcements from yesterday um, coming into shape? The e-visas, etc. Those were the, the fundamental announcements that, that needed to be made in order for uh, any relationship to move forward. So we're talking about the, uh, first of all, uh, after the, uh, uh, the, the establishment of diplomatic relations, you will need representation. Yeah. Uh, with representation, you will need uh, financial institutions to work with one another. You will need uh, flights, you'll need uh, e-visas, you'll need a way for people to communicate with one another. And so um, I don't think that we have ever been through a similar process uh, like the one that we are seeing today. It has never been this fast, has it? I mean, having studied diplomatic relations of lots of other countries, I have never seen it happen this quickly before. Uh, we are setting a, a precedent and uh, it's not just us, it's the UAE as well. We're moving in parallel uh, and uh, we're very hopeful and very optimistic. It's, it, it's just incredibly um, moving to watch. Um, on the, on the um, geostrategic um, aspect of the relations, how do you see the Kingdom of Bahrain cooperating with Israel to maintain regional security against um, interventionist powers in the region, such as Iran? Well, the, uh, when we look at Bahrain and its, its uh, long-standing commitment to regional peace and stability, we'll find a lot that has been done. Uh, in our relationship with the United States, uh, not only do we continue to host the Fifth Fleet, but we're also home to the International Maritime Security Construct, where we have a number of countries coming together to protect the waterways of uh, the Gulf. Um, in return, we're looking at uh, guaranteeing the commercial waterways be open uh, because we've seen how uh, sometimes uh, an attack on a certain geographic location uh, might be an attack on, uh, on, on, on the global infrastructure of a certain industry. And so uh, uh, we've always played our part. We will continue to play our part in, in, in the region. And uh, we, will, we will continue to um, push back on any aggression that comes our way. We've been doing so for uh, four decades now and we will continue to do so. Yes, and, and I imagine cooperation with, with Israel, a, a kind of fellow regional power who, who understands the neighborhood, would be quite useful in that endeavor. But here's the thing. When we talk about the Accords, yes, it is so multifaceted. There is so much that uh, the countries involved can do uh, that, it, I mean, what was interesting and striking to me was in Bahrain, um, when it was announced, there were uh, civil societies that supported the move. But what surprised me was the uh, sports clubs. Uh, they came out with very positive uh, uh, supporting uh, statements. And I think that every industry is looking at it from their lens. Yes. And, uh, and it, 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 then when I started to think about it, I'm like, okay, uh, they probably wanted to uh, go to some competitions. Uh, in the past, they weren't able to. Now this, this is, uh, oh, there's a way to do so. Um, but again, uh, the, a lot is going on. Uh, we are uh, monitoring progress uh, every single day, and we are uh, pushing through. Uh, 
um, to uh, make sure that uh, those opportunities are exploited by both our peoples. It's 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 uh, yeah, and it's it's truly exciting to see. I've seen it from the World Jewish Congress perspective. I've seen it from the academic perspective, from all sorts of angles. And it's um, the people to people relationships is something that is really palpable. That um, there have been even that even under a pandemic where most of us are grounded, there is people are still making the effort to communicate by Zoom and by you know, Instagram and by social media. And this thirst to understand each other is, is really is remarkable. Well, Dr. Sofa, this is exactly what, what you do. Uh, and it, it is my hope that we will continue to work together beyond this, this very conversation. Uh, with, with your scope and breadth, the World Jewish Congress can play an invaluable role for all uh, Jews and Muslims. Uh, we can work hand in hand to better educate our people yes. throughout the world uh, about the efforts and explore ways that both uh, Muslims and Jews can benefit from one another. Most definitely. And this is something that our president, Ambassador, Ambassador Ronald Lauder, takes also uh, very seriously and does encourage us on a daily basis to work on and um, inshallah we'll be able to um, to work together very successfully and very uh, very warmly in the very very near future and um, and really I am we're all very very much looking forward to it and um, it really has been a true true honor and pleasure to be able to speak with you today uh, your excellency and Please God, this is the first of many, many more conversations. Um, hopefully next time it'll be a bit longer. Uh, we seemed, I think we could, we could have spoken for a lot longer, but um, I understand we have, we have reached our time limit today, but please God, this is a wonderful opening to a lot more dialogue. And on behalf of the World Jewish Congress, I would really like to thank you and to um, send all of, all of our best wishes to the government of Bahrain um, and to your royal family and um, to all our viewers around the world. Thank you, Dr. Sofer. I appreciate uh, you hosting me and the World Jewish Congress. I was pleased to meet the president, uh, to see the president again uh, a couple of months ago, and I uh, I look forward to continuing this uh, long relationship that we have built for many years now. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to our viewers uh, around the world. Um, please tune in to our next web talk and um, be healthy and be safe. All the best. Shalom. Salam.